Hello and welcome to my history podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have always wanted to share my love and passion of history, especially in a form of a podcast. So I thought our first topic should be one of my favourite royal families of English history, and that is the Tudors. And what better place to start than with the first Tudor monarch, King Henry VII. Henry VII, the first Tudor king, husband of Queen Elizabeth of York and father to two queens of Europe and King Henry VIII. Henry VII became king on the 22nd of August 1485 when he defeated King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. Legend has it that they found the old king's crown in a bush and crowned Henry Tudor, King of England, on the battlefield. Although, I think it's just that. A legend. Despite the battle not taking place till the 22nd of August, King Henry VII dates the start of his reign as the 21st of August 1485. That's the day before. This is Henry's way of asserting his claim as the rightful king and not to be seen as a usurper, like his predecessor. But that makes me question, why did he feel the need to do so? Is it because Henry realised that his claim to the throne was not a strong one? Is it because he knew himself that he wasn't the rightful king? Well today we are going to explore the founder of the Tudor dynasty, King Henry VII. Henry Tudor was born on the 28th of January 1457 to Lady Margaret Beaufort and Edmund Tudor at Pembroke Castle in Wales. Henry's birth, although a joyous occasion for Margaret, who would later devote her life to her son and him becoming king, was a difficult and traumatic experience. Margaret gave birth at the tender age of 13 and had been widowed just over two months earlier as her husband, Edmund Tudor, died on the 3rd of November, 1456. Henry's uncle Jasper and father Edmund were the younger half-brothers of King Henry VI. We can infer that the half-siblings got along as both Jasper and Edmund were bestowed titles of the Earl of Pembroke and Richmond respectively despite having no blood of English royalty. The three brothers shared the same mother, Dowager Queen Catherine of Valois, the youngest daughter of King Charles VI of France. Through her, they had a claim to the French throne, but not the English. So, where did Henry's claim come from? Henry Tudor's claim to the English throne comes from his mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort who was the great-granddaughter of Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt, the third son of King Edward III of England. However, Henry's claim is not as cut and dry as it seems. While John of Gaunt was married to his second wife, Constance of Castile, Catherine and John had several illegitimate children. John eventually married Catherine in 1396 and their children were legitimised. However, This came with a catch that all of their descendants were barred from claiming the throne. As a descendant of John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford, Henry Tudor has diluted royal blood, but he was technically barred from claiming the throne. Compared to many kings of English history, we actually know very little about Henry's childhood, as he was part of the minor gentry and was not a prince destined to be king. However, what we do know is that his father Edmund's death meant that Henry's uncle Jasper would become head of the family, who swiftly remarried his sister-in-law, Margaret Beaufort, to Sir Henry Stafford for her own safety and security. This was because by time Henry was born in 1457, the Wars of the Roses, also known as the Cousins' War, between the Yorks and the Lancastrians, was in full swing. 
and Henry was a threat to the throne just by being a Lancastrian male. And as the years go by, Henry's place in the line of succession was continually creeped forward. Four years later, in 1461, the Lancastrian army suffered a terrible defeat at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. Edward, Earl of March, also the future King Edward IV, killed 3,000 Welshmen, and one of the victims was Henry's own grandfather, Owen Tudor, who was executed at the Market Cross in Hereford. Jasper fled and promised to avenge his father with the might of the Lord. Later that year, in March 1461, was the Battle of Taunton, also known as the Bloody Meadows, known as such because it has the highest death count in English history. The York army went for an all-out onslaught on the Lancastrians. 28,000 people were killed in one day. Just for a bit of comparison, 19,000 people died in the Battle of the Somme. Jasper was not present at the Battle of Taunton. However, the Lancastrian defeat meant it was dangerous for Jasper to remain in England and Wales. As a result, Uncle Jasper was forced to flee. Jasper was stripped of his title as the Earl of Pembroke and the current King Henry VI, his wife Queen Margaret of Anjou and their son Edward Prince of Wales fled to Scotland and Edward, Earl of March, was crowned King Edward IV in the June. OK, so with Jasper gone, what happened to young Henry Tudor? Well, Henry Tudor was placed in the charge of the new Earl of Pembroke, William Herbert, where he was brought up at Raglan Castle, under the care of Herbert's wife, Anne. It wasn't uncommon at the time for members of the nobility to have their children cared and educated away from the family home. Margaret Beaufort would pay occasional visits to her son, but they would not be reunited for another nine years until 1470. In 1470, King Edward IV received a brutal blow after nine years on the throne. The man that put him there, Warwick the Kingsmaker, switched allegiances from the House of York to the House of Lancaster and forced King Edward IV from the throne. Edward IV went into exile, his queen Elizabeth Woodville and her children sought sanctuary at Westminster Abbey and the Lancastrian king Henry VI returned to the throne. This provided Margaret Beaufort the opportunity to reunite with her son Henry Tudor and as her family fortunes had changed she was able to pay for a bow and a sheave of arrows to give to her son for his amusement. and. Jasper Tudor was able to return from exile and was restored to his earldom. This sense of normality for the Lancastrians did not last long, as King Edward IV returned from exile in Holland in March 1471. Within the space of a month, two critical battles had taken place. The Battle of Barnet on the 14th of April and the Battle of Tewkesbury on the 4th of May. King Edward IV had reclaimed the throne of England and the battles resulted in the deaths of Warwick the Kingsmaker, Henry Tudor's stepfather, Henry Stafford, and Edward, Prince of Wales, the son of King Henry VI. Who, by the way, King Henry VI suspiciously died in the Tower of London after that battle. The death of King Henry VI and the Prince of Wales meant that Henry Tudor had become the sole surviving Lancastrian heir. The other two Beaufort males had already died. After the defeat of the Lancastrian forces, Jasper Tudor was trapped within Pembroke Castle. The siege of the castle was broken by a man called David Thomas. This allowed Jasper and Henry Tudor to flee to the harbour, where they hid in a cellar that was owned by Thomas White. When night fell, they escaped through a tunnel and the pair boarded a ship to France to seek refuge from King Louis XI of France and ask for his support. Or at least that was the plan, but the ship got blown off course and they landed in Brittany, which is a part of France today, 
but in 1471 was its own duchy. Duke Francis II of Brittany offered the Tudor travellers refuge, but he realised the value of the two and kept them under close supervision. He kept nephew and uncle separate, with Henry being sent to the isolated Tour de Elven, where he was imprisoned on the sixth floor of its keep. Henry Tudor would effectively spend the next 14 years of his life as Francis II's prisoner. During his exile, King Edward IV made several failed attempts to entice Francis to give him the Tudors, including offering his eldest daughter Elizabeth of York as bride to Henry. Although none of Edward's attempts worked, this may have sown the seed later in life for Henry to marry Elizabeth, as their match would be a strong one politically. On the 9th of April 1483, King Edward IV died and is succeeded by his son, Edward, who becomes King Edward V. However, due to his age, he required a Lord Protector. So, King Edward IV's only surviving brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, becomes Lord Protector. Although, quite frankly, he doesn't exactly do a very good job, as both King Edward V and his little brother Richard mysteriously go missing in the Tower of London. I'm not too sure how you misplace human beings, so I'm very much sold on the theory that Richard Duke of Gloucester had the boys murdered so he could become king, as I believe that provides a pretty solid motive. But if you think differently to me, I'd be interested to know what you think. Do you believe in a different theory? Do you think Richard has become another figure done dirty by history? Let me know either way in the comments or on my social media. 26 of June, 1483, England had a new king. Shock! It's King Richard III, the former Duke of Gloucester. The usurpation of Richard III divided some of the Yorkists. There was even a tiny revolt in the October led by the Duke of Buckingham to dispose of Richard and replace him with Henry Tudor. But the revolt was defeated before Henry and his ships could land in England. With Buckingham's execution later that month, Henry and his ships turned tail back to Brittany. At this point in history, Henry is 13th in line to the throne. Well, if he's that far down the pecking order, why did so many people back him for the throne? Well, quite frankly, they didn't think that the other 12 could actually beat Richard in battle. That and you've got to remember that Henry was the last Lancastrian heir, which meant the other 12 were Yorkists. And if that's the case, they're probably quite happy where they are, or they didn't think that another usurpation was worth the risk. Christmas Day, 1483. In an attempt to rally support, Henry Tudor pledged an oath to marry Elizabeth of York, should he become king. This pledge was more powerful than what it may seem. At this point in history, the country had been in a civil war for nearly 30 years, constantly changing kings, family allegiances, and the country was tired and bored. They were looking for stability. A Lancastrian king with a York heir as his wife? Now that would be ideal. Those who saw Richard as a usurper would rally round Elizabeth as the eldest surviving York heir, and the Lancastrians get their king. Any child produced from that union would be of both York and Lancaster, finally reuniting the two warring houses. By summer of 1485, Brittany was at war with France. King Richard III offered to provide a force of several thousand archers to aid Brittany in their conflict with France. But... In return, the two Tudors, Henry and Jasper, were to be arrested and returned to England. Francis II agreed. Fortunately, Henry was tipped off about the plan with just hours to spare and he managed to flee to the French court of King Charles VIII. The French agreed to equip Henry with money, ships and mercenaries of the worst sort to launch an attack on Richard and Henry and his army set sail from the mouth of the River Seine on the 1st of August, 1485. Henry and his troops arrived at the coast of Pembrokeshire on the 7th of August, 1485, 
and proceeded to march inland, amassing support as they travelled closer to London, eventually meeting Richard's army at the field of Bosworth. While Henry had been in exile, his mother, Margaret Beaufort, had remarried, this time to Thomas Stanley, a Yorkist landowner. However, Margaret had been begging Stanley to support her son's cause, and as a result, King Richard III had become very suspicious of Stanley's loyalty. As the battle drew nearer, more and more Yorkist landowners were defecting to Henry's side, and suspecting treachery from Henry's stepfather, Thomas Stanley, Richard had imprisoned Stanley's son, George, Lord Strange, to ensure that Stanley was on his best behaviour. On the 22nd of August, 1485, the day of the Battle of Bosworth, Richard had awoken to find that his camp was unprepared to hear mass or eat breakfast. Richard, who himself had slept badly, supposedly from a haunting nightmare, managed to get his army lined up for battle in the early hours of the 22nd of August. It was clear Richard's army was vastly superior with his countless multitude of men. Henry, on the other hand, bless him, only had 5,000 men at best, and he had to keep the French mercenaries away from the native soldiers in fear of them fighting each other. Not the best start to the battle of your life. Richard commenced his charge towards Henry's troops and noted that the men led by the Earl of Northumberland were standing still and they were refusing to fight. Richard spotted Henry at the back of the battlefield surrounded by a band of soldiers and charged towards their ranks. Richard's men managed to kill Henry's standard bearer, Sir William Brandon, while Richard's own standard bearer, Sir Percival Thurwall, had both of his legs hacked away beneath him. Nice. With Henry fearing imminent death, Sir William Stanley, Henry's step-uncle, charged with 3,000 men, which saw Richard being swept into a nearby marsh, where he was killed as the blows of the halberds rained down on him. Legend has it that it was these blows to the head that killed him, and that he was wearing his crown into battle, which undoubtedly would have made the blows a thousand times worse. Richard, unsurprisingly, suffered massive trauma to the head, including one wound which cut clean through the skull and into his brain. The battle lasted less than two hours, and it was Henry's stepfather, Thomas Stanley, who found the old king's crown in the bushes and crowned Henry, King Henry VII of England, on the battlefield. I'm not entirely convinced that it played out exactly like this, but this is the story that the Tudors wanted us to remember. And as for the Tudors tweaking history, Henry VII recorded the start of his reign at Parliament as the 21st of August 1485, the day before the Battle of Bosworth. This was his way of claiming that he was already the rightful king before the battle and he wasn't a usurper, but he was rather a king that was just reclaiming a crown that was rightfully his. Henry VII was coronated on the 30th of October 1485 at Westminster Abbey. Henry had claimed the throne through conquest and he therefore had himself coronated before his wedding as a sign to his people that he was the rightful king in his own right and not through his marriage, which arguably did strengthen his claim. But like a lot. During his coronation, the Archbishop of Canterbury declared Henry to be the rightful and undoubted inheritor by the laws of God and man to the English crown. Months later, on the 18th of January, 1486, King Henry VII made good of his promise and he married the eldest daughter of King Edward IV, Elizabeth of York. Although a political move, 
Henry presented his marriage as an act of reconciliation between the two houses, and it was the combination of the house's two roses that produced the infamous Tudor rose. The marriage was concocted between the bride and groom's mothers, Lady Margaret Beaufort and the Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville. It was Margaret who suggested Elizabeth as the suitable bride for her son to end the conflict. At the time of the wedding, Henry was 29 and Elizabeth was 19. Although very little is recorded of the actual ceremony, one court poet remarked, Great gladness filled all the kingdom to see the warring houses united. Additionally, Henry had Elizabeth's illegitimacy reversed, an act that King Richard III, Elizabeth's uncle by the way, had done during his reign to secure his usurpation. This can also be interpreted as Henry believing that the two young princes, Elizabeth's brothers, were dead, as reversing her illegitimacy would also bring her brothers back into the line of succession had they been alive. Nine months later, in late September, the couple welcomed their first child, Arthur. Named after the fictional king, and the apparent ancestor of Henry VII? That's a discussion for another time. The new Prince of Wales was born in Winchester on either the late of the 19th or early hours of the 20th of September. Historians debate the actual day of birth as not enough evidence is provided to secure an exact date. And they all lived happily ever after. For two years. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look into the early life of King Henry VII, the founder of the Tudor dynasty. If you did, please support me the best way that you can, whether it's subscribing or watching or listening to another. In part two, we'll be exploring Henry's life as King of England. But until then, I hope you have a wonderful day.